Hi there, this is Manuel with Antagma. You probably heard that the Geometry Node guys at the Blender Foundation created a new system for Geometry Nodes. So they changed the design, the architecture of Geometry Nodes. And if you download Blender 3.0 Alpha today, you will find that the Geometry Nodes are working quite differently than before. That means all the tutorials I created for Geometry Nodes are obsolete. And that's why I try to redo one of them to show you the differences between the new system and the old system. Before we start, make sure that you go to blender.org and then scroll all the way down on the download page until you reach the download Blender Experimental and then download Blender 3.0 Alpha. I'm using the version October the 17th. You have to have at least this version to have all the nodes and to have the new system in place. It's only working in Blender 3.0 Alpha right now. With that out of the way, let's go into Blender and start. But before I open Blender 3.0, I will open up Blender 2.93.5. Why that? Because I am intending to create my cube grid and for this I need an image texture geometry node. Unfortunately, in the current build that you can download, the image texture node is not there yet. That's why I'm using a trick to bring in the image texture as vertex color. I downloaded a little add-on for Blender 2.93 and I use it to bake a shader to vertex colors. Then I have the vertex color on the object and I just append it to the 3.0 alpha scene and thus I have all the vertex colors in my setup. The add-on is called Bake to Vertex Color and you can download it from this page here from Gumroad. It is free. Thank you, Daniel Beisted, for creating this. If you want to support Daniel, he just writes that he wants you to support the Blender development by donating to the Blender development fund. So consider donating if you are using this on a regular basis. I will put the link to download this in the description. Now, with this installed, I already baked my shader to vertex colors. And what you see here is the vertex color grid that I created. Finally, let's switch to Blender 3.0. This is a default scene. Let's delete the cube. We won't need it. And instead, let's file append the grid that I created with the vertex colors in 2.93. Append. So here it is. Unfortunately, the vertex colors do not show up in 3.0. I think this is a bug. There is one thing you can do, and that is to go to edit preferences and then on the experimental tab that you get if you tick on developer extras here under interface you can tick sculpt vertex colors that helps a little nevertheless you have to switch to vertex paint to see the vertex colors in this current build here we have a grid and the grid has some vertex colors baked into this layer called baked vertex color we want to use them to distribute cubes on this grid and to scale them in height by the colors that we have here on the vertices so let's create another viewport and switch this over to geometry nodes and on this side here i will just go to object mode and let's create a new geometry nodes tree and let's call this cube grid because that is the effect I intend to do. Now, these nodes are familiar. You have a group input with the geometry coming in and the group output with the geometry going out. If you cut this connection, everything vanishes because no polygons are describing the object anymore. First things first, let's have a look at this grid. You see it is quite dense. I have quite some subdivisions here and I want to put cubes on the points. To do this, let's use an instance on point node. This looks a little different than before. It has more options. First, you connect the points and then the outgoing geometry to the output and everything vanishes because we don't have an instance yet. Instead of using an instance from the outliner or from the scene, we can now create a procedural instance. So let's do this. Let's just create a procedural cube. Cube. This node will just create the polygonal description of a cube, one by one by one meter. So let's use this to connect it here. And you see, as soon as you do that, you get the cubes as instances on the points of the grid. That is quite nice because no need to model an object anymore. The cubes are too big currently, so let's put 0.003 here. And now I have cubes that are not intersecting and have little gaps between them. And now I have this scale input here. And you can see that I can use it to scale my cubes. That is great. But the second thing that you notice is if I scale them in Z, they are scaling symmetrically up and down. And I don't want that. Last time I moved the pivot but this is a procedural cube, so I cannot move the pivot to the bottom of the cube. But fortunately, this node here operates in world coordinates, so I can just transform this cube up a little bit. So let's use a transform node, transform. 
and put it here. Let's move it up half of the Z size. That is 0 0.0015. And as soon as we do that, you see that now the cubes are only scaling upwards not downwards anymore. That easy, we created a grid of cubes. But now we want to use vertex colors to scale them actually. Now everything starts to work quite differently because you don't have any named attributes inside of geometry nodes anymore. Instead, you have to bring in the attributes that exist outside of the geometry nodes modifier by adding them to this group input. So that means you see this hollow port down here and I can drag a connection from there. As soon as I connect this connection to a node, this port is created. Let's create ourselves a separate RGB node. And now let's connect this color here to this port. But before we do this, take a look. This port here looks very different than the other ports. It is a little diamond with a dot in the middle. And that means this port is not a geometry port. Geometry ports are green. And it is not a standard value port like this one here. Instead, it is a field, a so-called field. And what does that mean? Well, it means that this port can handle different values for each and every element that the node is operating on. In our case, we want to read the vertex color. So as soon as we pipe the vertex color into one of these field ports, the node will separate all the values one after the next. So let's connect this to this port and you see this changes to yellow, indicating that this is a color. It is called image at the moment, but we can go to the group field here and rename it to say vertex color. And what that does is it creates a new input field here on our modifier. This is an input field and we have a color to set here. We can click here and set the color. But instead of using a single color, we can click on this little button here and that changes this field to be an attribute field. Now we can specify the name of an attribute here and this attribute will be read by the network and it will be available over this port. And that is the way how we can read the baked vertex color that we created. So let's copy the name of this and switch back to the modifier and put it here. Now all the vertex color is coming in. Of course we don't see anything, but the vertex color is coming in. And the connection line that connects this port with a separate RGB is a dashed line indicating that this is not geometry data or single values, but a field, meaning a lot of different values per element. So the noting style changed quite a bit. Instead of working on attributes, you can now work with the values directly. And I think that is making stuff a lot easier. Now that we have these values separated, let's do a combine XYZ, a combine XYZ, because we only want to use one of the channels to drive our Z value here of the scale. So let's, for example, take the green channel and connect it here to Z and set the X and Y values to one because we don't want to change the scale of X and Y. And now we can connect this to the scale port here. And if you look closely, you see this is a field two. So that means that this scale field accepts different values coming in for all the individual points that this node is operating on. So if I now connect this to the scale, you see that we start to see our vertex texture that we created. Of course, at the moment, it's not very exaggerated because the values are between zero and one. So the scaling is quite shallow. Nevertheless, it is working. To make this a little more pronounced, let's multiply the values. So let's just put down a math node. And you see that the math node now has field ports too. That means the math node cannot only work on single values, instead it can work on fields. So let's connect this field here and that one there. And let's multiply all of this by a factor of 200. Don't want to add, instead we want to multiply. And you see, that is what we get. Now we created our effect and I think the noting style is so much easier than before because we don't have to write an attribute, read the attribute again, and then write it to a temporary attribute. Instead, we can work on the individual iterative values all at the same time by using these field nodes. The geometry is in place, but I don't want to stop here. Instead, I would like to transfer the vertex colors of the points to the instances. Unfortunately, we cannot set colors on instances yet, 
we can only transform instances, but we can do the same trick as last time and make the instances real. So convert the instances to real geometry and real geometry can have vertex colors. Last time we had to use a trick to do that. This time that is not necessary anymore. Instead, we can create a realize instances node. Here we have the instances coming out. And if we connect the node here, you see the viewport display changes because now all the instances are converted into real geometry. Before we set the attribute on them, we want to apply a material because I intend to use the attribute that I'm about to set inside of cycles. So let's look for a material node, set material is it called, and connect it after the realize instances. So we want to apply a material to the geometry. We first have to create a material. So let's quickly go to materials and let's create a new material and let's call this instances like so. And if I quickly switch over to the shader editor, that is what we get. And we want to use an attribute for shading. So let's create an attribute and connect it to the base color and let's call it instance color. Copy the name. This is not working right now because we don't have any instance color attribute on our geometry, but we will change that in a second. So back to geometry nodes editor. First, let's set this instances material here and it already works. Let's check if it is working by switching to cycles and then turn on rendering. And that is what we get. And if we now quickly switch to the shader editor again, we can cut this connection and see, well, that is working. The material is applied, but of course we don't have an attribute yet. So if we go back to geometry nodes, we can change that. Let's now set the attribute to the geometry. And that works the same as reading an attribute. Instead of applying the attribute to the geometry stream as before, we want to create an output port on the modifier and that will set the attribute. So in theory, we could just take this value here and apply it here. Unfortunately, that won't work. If we do that, we get a field here, an output field. And if we look at the modifier, we get this output attributes and we could specify an attribute name here, but the domain of the attribute is different and thus it is not working. Think about it for a second. Here we have geometry. So we have the individual points of the grid, but after the instance on points, each point is replaced by cube and a cube has eight vertices on its own. That means that the points are increasing eight times. We have a lot more points and thus this attribute here is not defined correctly because we don't have enough values. We only have values for the points, not for the cubes. So we somehow have to convert this attribute to the new domain. Fortunately, we can't do that because since today we have a transfer attribute node and this transfer attribute node looks quite like the old one. It has this nearest face interpolation. That means it uses spatial proximity to transfer the attributes, but now it has a better mode. And this mode is called index. That means we can work with the index numerically to create a mapping that works. This node is asking for a target and the target is the geometry of the grid. And now the attribute we want to convert is this attribute. It's a color. So let's switch this to color that breaks the connection again. So let's reconnect it. Great. And now we have this index here. After the instance on point node, we have a lot more indices than before because we have more geometry. So we want to read all of these indices and then apply a mathematical operation that transforms these indices to the indices before the instance on points. We can do that by using the new index input attribute. Here I have a node outputting the index. And now it is important to understand the context of this node because it makes a lot of difference where I apply the node. The node always reads the index of the geometry at the point where it is applied. And we intend to apply this node to this transfer attribute and then set the output of this node to this vertex color output port here. So that means this node is determining the point where all of this chain is evaluated. And that means it is evaluated after the instance on points. So it is reading all the many indices that we have after this node. So let's do this. We can connect the index here and then we connect this here. It is still not working. And why not? Because the indices are differing. So let's introduce a mathematical operation to calculate the indices before. To do this, we need another mass node, like so, and we want to divide 
So we want to read all the indices after the instance on point node, but we want to divide them by eight because it's eight times as many indices. Now that we have this, look at the connections we created. This vertex color here wants to write to an attribute. So it is going this way along the wire, finding the transfer attribute, tries to execute this, that is only possible if all the inputs are evaluated. Then it finds this index, goes to the divide, and to evaluate the divide, it has to go to this index node. And that defines that this index node is reading the indices at this point in the graph. So it is the indices after the instance on point. If I would connect this index somewhere here before the instance on point, it would output different values. It would output the values of the grid but this way it is working. Now this node is looking at the indices of the geometry before, specified by target, and then reading the attribute, converting it, and setting it here. So the last thing we have to do is go to the group output, uh, thus to the modifier, and specify the attribute name here, and I already copied it from the shader graph, it is called instance color. Now the instance color is set, and if all goes well, if I switch to cycles rendering, the instance color should show up here. And that is the case. The attribute is converted. And not only that, because we are now using the index to convert the attribute, each cube just gets one color because one color of the points is converted into eight values for the eight points of the cubes. And we have the color inside of cycles. So the only thing missing is to make this a little bit more pretty. For this, let's switch to the shader editor again. And I want to use this attribute not only on the base color but on the subsurface color. Let's switch to Christensen Burley here and let's up the subsurface value a little bit and that creates some subsurface look. To make rendering faster let's switch to GPU compute and here we have it. Now Cycles X is in charge of rendering this and you see you get this very nice result. The last thing I want to do is to go to the scene and switch this light over to be an area light, like so. Let's make this light track to the field automatically. So let's go to constraints and add a track to constraint. And now in this target field, I want to drag my grid. And this way the light always points to the grid. Now select the light, make it quite a little bit bigger, like so, and maybe increase the power to 3000. Now you can just move this around until you get a pretty shading that shows the colors perfectly. The colors are a little desaturated. That is why I want to go to the shader editor one last time. And I want to introduce a gamma node just like last time to make the colors a little darker. So let's connect the gamma node here between these and let's switch this to two to make the colors a little darker and more saturated like so. And I'm not a particular fan of this yellowish tint. So let's introduce a U saturation before the gamma and let's alter the U a little bit by changing the U value to 0.34. And that gives this pinkish color that you know from the tutorial graphics. Maybe change the light a little to make sure that the speculars are distributed nicely and set your camera. And that is how you create a cube grid with geometry nodes fields. Let's have a last look at the network we created. And you see, this looks a lot more readable than it used to be because these field nodes operate on a lot of values at the same time. The wiring style tells us where we are using fields. And not only that, but the entire thing that we created is now reusable because the attribute definitions, the attribute names are all defined on the level of the modifier itself. I hope you like the new way of using geometry nodes. Let's see how many nodes they add, how quickly they do this, and what we can do with geometry nodes in the future. Thanks for listening and see you next time. If you like what we are doing, please consider becoming a Patreon. For supporting us and for access to more in-depth courses on topics like volume techniques or PDG or Vellum and more. To everybody who is already supporting us, thank you so much. Without your continuous support, Entagma would not be possible.